Thank you, George. My biggest hurdle today was to be able to uh, pronounce George's last name, George Athanas Kassos. Sackos. <laughs> but, uh, but thank you, George. It's my pleasure to be here. And um, I just, uh, you know, thank you for inviting me to uh, talk about Ben Graham and Bubbles. Um, it forced me to go back and reread some of Intelligent Investor and Security Analysis. And um, I got to tell you, I read that book even today, and it's such a wonderful book that was written in uh, 1934 for Security Analysis and 1949 for Intelligent Investor. Now, how was I exposed to this book? I thought I'd begin by just telling you that uh, I um, was fortunate to go to the Ivy Business School. Uh, now, I didn't look for the best business school in uh, Canada. I happened to be an immigrant, as George said. And the only place I could go, my brother was in London, Ontario. And the only place I could go was uh, to the Ivy Business School that I found out later on. It's a very, very good school, and uh, as Carol has told me many times, the best business school in the country. <laughs> so I was very fortunate to go there. Now, I did, uh, so I was looking for a job, and um, I got a job at this uh, company called Confederation Life Insurance Company. And there were four people who were selected for the second interview. And I got the job. No, this is what I for it. The reason I got the job at Confederation in 1974 was that three other guys didn't show up. <laughs> I was the only guy there. And uh, I had done a lot of work on efficient markets and uh, uh, alphas and betas and all this stuff. And um, John Watson, who was my boss, said to me, I don't want to hear all that. You've got to read Security Analysis. And he gave me a, a copy of Security Analysis by Ben Graham. I'd never seen it before. And I uh, did read it, and uh, I never talked about efficient markets again. And so for me, always the test is if someone's read it and uh, believes in it and likes it, um, then uh, I think you're, uh, you're, uh, you're a long way to be a value investor. So I read that uh, book a lot of, uh, many times um, after the, the exposure. And... Um, um, I was so taken up by that uh, book and Ben Graham, The Intelligent Investor, I read it so many times that I said to my uh, wife when our son was born that with her permission I'd call him Ben. And uh, fortunately, uh, Ben's also into value investing. <laughs> he hasn't gone into technical analysis or uh, anything like that. Um, and so uh, in t 31 years later, it was our privilege in 2005 to begin the Ben Graham Center for Value Investing, to expose students, like we want to expose to, uh, into this tremendous philosophy of value investing. Ben Graham was the father of security analysis. He began the profession. All of us at Hamlet Watson and Fairfax in the investment area have been exposed to it, and it really is a privilege for us to have the ability to uh, um, uh, begin that course with support, with many, many supporters, and um, and really the key person, the George. We, um, you know, for a course like that to be successful, you need a, a passionate uh, teacher, passionate person that uh, uh, likes uh, value investing, and we lucked out uh, when George decided to uh, uh, join uh, the Ivy Business School, and of course, through Carol's support, and through others at the Ivy Business School that uh, this came to be. Now, so what I wanted to talk to you about was in, for Ben Graham, many of you, I see Richard Rooney and I see a whole bunch of you, I'm not going to tell you anything uh, too different from uh, what you already know, um, but just to remind you, the tenets of Ben Graham, he talked about investment versus speculation, he talked about intrinsic value, he talked about many, many things, but the three important things that, for me at least, um, were important. One was, whenever you buy stocks, you're buying a part of a business. It's a, it's, you're not speculating, it's not, you're not trading it, you're not trying to set up. Uh, you're buying a piece of a business. And so you've got to know how the business operates, you've got to know who's running it, you've got to know how they make money, what's their track record, all of the things that you would look at when you buy a business. The second point he made was, you've got a stock market as a partner. And the partner is a manic depressive. 
Sometimes the partner wants to um, buy your interest at really high prices. Perhaps some of you might, might think that is today. And sometimes the partner will uh, want to sell it to you at a very low price. And uh, Ben said, you just take advantage of that. The rest of the time, you don't even worry about the stock prices. But when the opportunity exists, to sell it at a high price, buy it at a low price, that's the only time stock prices make any difference. Otherwise, fluctuations. And the big plus is, whatever you say, if you say no today, tomorrow you get a quote again. Partner doesn't disappear. Private business. You might not have someone who comes and offers you the price, but the next day you'll get uh, another price offered to you. And uh, but what you can do is don't ever think that the market knows more than what you do about that underlying business. Because that's the biggest mistake you can make. And it's made in Wall Street and Bay Street all, all the time. But don't ever think the market knows more than you in terms of your business. But the most important, that's the second. So you said stocks is a part of business. Uh, Mr. Market. But the last one was the most important one, which is a margin of safety. Whatever you do when you're investing, look for a margin of safety. And he figured the three biggest, uh, the three most important words in the investment business was a margin of safety. You have a margin of safety when, um, when you buy anything. And he explained it perhaps in, uh, you know, uh, why do Roman bridges, historically, Roman bridges have lasted for a long, long time. He said, uh, why did they last for a long time? So the key reason was the people who designed the bridges had to stand underneath it before the traffic went on. So they made sure there was a massive margin of safety. Uh, where, and uh, bridges lasted for years and years and years. Uh, so, very, so it's very simple. You're trying to find out what a company's worth, and you're buying it, uh, as he would say, a dollar for 50 cents. And, um, and you're able to buy it at 50 cents only because there's some perceived problem. If everything is going well and selling the high price, so you have to have a problem. You have to have uh, some pessimism. Uh, Sir John Templeton, many, many years ago, said the difference between most human activity and investments is, for example, he says, if you were building a refinery, an oil refinery, you get 10 chemical engineers, you ask them for their suggestions, their plans, and mostly if you follow the consensus, you'll get a good refinery. So you take 10 oil engineers. You recommend, and you ask them what they recommend. If all of them are recommending oil stocks, it's highly likely that you'll lose money. And the reason is, he said, when one person decides to change his mind, the oil analyst can say sell, because everyone's bought. So there's no one, uh, nowhere, to, nowhere, nowhere for it to go but down. And uh, that idea that the consensus quite often is wrong is what Ben Graham's um, had addressed in 1934, and why his philosophy will last for uh, a long, long time. Um, what I wanted to do today, though, is to talk about what Ben's experience with bubbles was. I've got a few uh, slides for you, and then I want to open it up for questions. You've heard a lot of presentations, so I'll uh, have a few slides, and then open it up for, for questions. Um, so Ben Graham had two big bubbles that he went through. The first one was 1929 to 32. It's the biggest one, perhaps, in history in, in the world. And the second one was 1972 to 74. So let's see what the first one was. So you can see uh, 1929, 1932, down 89%. Massive bear market. A, a, a one that we haven't uh, really seen, experienced any place else. If you want to see it, Ben was managing money. He began in 1914 in the investment business. And so here's his performance. In 1929, 30, 31, 32, and the West of the Dow Jones Index. And um, you can see that in 1930, he had almost gone bankrupt down 50%, the uh, index was down 29%. Uh, he says in this book, he realized his prices were too high, but he had good investments, in, and his investments had a margin of safety 
but most importantly, he borrowed money to sell it to the bigger state. He had margin, and that magnified its loss. And um, he had a 67, 70% rate of return, um, uh, a decline. Not much different on an annual basis from the uh, Dow Jones. Um, but what they didn't see at the time was the stock market dropped, but it was followed by an economic collapse, which there are many reasons to think won't happen again. But that's what they missed. You know, like unemployment, 33%, and the gross national product was down 50% in 1929 and 32. So Ben experienced this. He was there. He lived through this. The second one he did, he went through, was 72 to 74. 1972 to 74, and he passed away in 76, when he was uh, 82 years old. And he saw this. This, uh, you know, some of you remember the Nifty 50. You remember uh, Avon, Eastman, Eastman Kodak, Polaroid, McDonald's, some of the best companies were selling at 80 times earnings, 90 times earnings. And um, when this happened, they dropped, the stock prices dropped dramatically. Uh, the index dropped 45%. But a lot of these nifty 50 stocks dropped 75%, 80%. Went from 90 times PE to single-digit price value And companies like GE, uh, McDonald's, uh, some of the best companies at the time, didn't come back to their prices for 10, 15 years, even though their earnings expanded significantly because the price earnings ratio is that high. So this is um, what he experienced. And he said, looking back in 75, 76, now he's looking at 1929 and he's saying, what would a conservative investor have done in these heady eras? What would you have done in these two time periods? And he says, he has his words, I'm just quoting what he said, I must, must mournfully say that he would have to do the near impossible, turn his back on them and let them alone. Stay away from them because the margin of safety wasn't there. Um, I have for you just my own, some of you have seen this, my own experiences, and uh, the oil stocks. When the music stopped in 1981, 83, yeah, uh, you know, some of the, the petroleum went bankrupt at the time, but here's a whole bunch of stocks that went down um, between 75 and 95%. More recently, 99 to 2001, you had very significant drops in some of the senior stocks like Amazon.com and Yahoo and Cisco. Some of them are still up there. Um, and junior stocks have just got, de just got decimated. And again, in 1999 and 2000, it looked like it would never happen. It would go on forever. Um, so when you look at all of these bubbles. Um, I'm going to talk about where we are today, and then open it up for questions. Ben Graham in 1972 said, there's not enough margin of safety. I can't see any margin of safety again, and you have to be very, very careful and of course 73, 74, the bear market um, took place. And he believed in diversification, and he was writing for the average investor, and he wanted to study it, and he figured anyone would do well. Um, but what, what, what is interesting was in the 73 edition of Intelligent Investor, he went back, and now he's, uh, you know, he's retired, and he's looking back, and he's uh, saying, you know, it's odd. He worked from 1936 to 56, 20 <coughs> long years, in a company called Graham Newman, true partners. He had a 20% uh, annual return year by year for 20 years. And um, late 40s, early 50s, he got a stock that they really liked. 50% block became available. They buy it, and he's got 20, 25% of his investment fund in one stock. 20 to 25% in one stock. He never would do that, but quite liked it. They bought it. The stock did very well. Went way up. If you're talking about growth and value, well, this is a growth stock, and it just grew and grew and grew looking at 72, and he says, my goodness, this one stock went up 200 times, they never sold, went up 200 times, made more money than the 20 years in aggregate, than the 20 years that I had managing Graham Newman. 
total cumulative profits of Graham Newman were less than this one stock made over 20 years. And he had a, no diversification, he had 20, 25 percent, it became a much bigger percentage over time. And he's reflecting on that, and, and that was 72. Came with a stock with Geico. And oddly enough, of course, 75, Geico was diversifying and, buy, and expanding, and uh, lost money in 75, and 76 was very close to bankruptcy. Warren Buffett comes in, refinance it. The stock goes from 60 to one and a half dollars. Warren refinances it, and of course the rest is history. It's a terrific company today on top of the set. So my point is, um, Ben was flexible in his thinking, but he always looked for marginal safety. He looked at marginal safety for the unexpected that can surprise you. And, um, and whenever you measure results, it's the time that you, the, the point in time when you look back and see what happened, because that was, the 72 Geico was flying. Now, where are we today? Here are just a few charts, and then I'd like to answer any questions that you might have. These are things that you might have seen. Stock market capitalization as a percentage of nominal GDP, going back to the 1920s. You can see in 1999, 2000, we went right up to 160%. Looks like we were coming down. Interest rates were allowed to go right down to 1%. It's back up now to 120. But the average, the median, going back for a long time, is way below. Now there are changes. More companies are public. We have more of uh, the American companies internationally oriented. Um, but that, to us, is saying, you know, as value investors, we look at regression to the mean. Be very careful. This is uh, the Japanese experience. In Japan, in 1989-1990, the Nikkei Dao, which is the uh, green line, was about 40,000. And 15 years later, in 2003, it was below 10,000. And we went and looked at stocks, and pretty well any stock you had during that time period. There were a few exceptions, but broadly speaking, uh, the market went down 75%, and you couldn't have made money in the Nikkei, but on the other hand, if you bought 10-year government bonds, Japanese government bonds, they went from 8%, the red line, to uh, less than 1%, and you made a lot of money. Um, I was in Japan in 87, 88, and when I spoke to them, I said, oh, man, this is like, I'm, you know, like, and the Nippon Telephone was at 200 times earnings. They said, this is Japan, it's different. We worked with Kirisu, the land price is not going to go down, we're different. Today, you go to the Americans and you talk to the Americans, they say, no, no, that's Japan. We're different. We have free enterprises. We know how to handle the economy. We fire, we uh, face up to our problems quickly. We move on. Just perspective for you as you look at where we stand. The bond market, that just shows you emerging. If you look at high yield spreads, look at any spreads that you want to look at, it's way down. And you'll see 1998, 1999, how they can, you know, spike up very, very quickly. That's what happened in 1998, 1999. We're not getting paid today for the bond markets. Finally, my last slide for you. It's, uh, we think it's a huge amount of risk. I got this from grants. Structure, this, this idea exists in the marketplace that you can take any risk, put it into a structure, into an asset-backed bond, and you can eliminate or get rid of the risk. And here's structured finance, and it's gone to, this is the S&P, uh, the amount of dollars of bonds that are being appraised, rated by S&P. It's two trillion dollars. There's subprime there, there's all sorts of uh, uh, bonds that are there. And, um, and a lot of them are triple A. There's a uh, Less than five or six companies, I think, in the United States that have a AAA rating. Companies, there's thousands of these structures that have AAA. And we think there's a lot of risk. And if you just want to think of risk, look at the two trillion. Everyone's thinking of global liquidity, right? If you have a 50%, I'm just picking a number, 50% drop, that's a trillion dollars that disappears from this. Liquidity regresses. A lot of risk here. If you go back, uh, Grant had a very nice little uh, table, which I'll just show you here. If you look at 1997, 1998, 
was very low, the uh, structured finance in that uh, chart, very small amounts. And, um, and you say, okay, how do those structured bonds do? Well, we have uh, AAA at the time, 97, 98, AAA high yield collateralized bond obligations. There were 56 of them at the time. Today, there's only 22. Double A's, double A's at the time, 97, 98, 22. Today, there's two. Triple B, there was 78. Today, there's only three. So the risk in this area is very significant. We monitor it. Our Brian Bradstreet looks at it. Um, and we think it's very significant. So what um, do I have for you? I just um, I say to you, you have to be very careful. We think of it as uh, uh, Ben Graham saying, no margin of safety. We thinking that there's a possibility of a 1 in 50, 1 in 100 year storm coming. You've got to protect yourself. You don't know, if it, you know, you don't know when Katrina comes in. You've got to protect yourself. You've got to survive from that. And, um, um, and we think that's uh, our conclusion when we look at all these uh, markets, the excitement in world stock market, bond market, and real estate markets. And I thought a uh, fitting uh, comment would be uh, what the French, the French watchers said was their investment philosophy. Long before Ben Graham, they said, uh, you'll excuse my French, acheté au canyon, one day or clarion, which none of you will uh, understand my accent, but in English it said, buy when you hear the sound of cannon, sell when you hear the sound of trumpets. And today, I don't watch it myself, we hear the sound of trumpets. So with that, I will be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. China and India are growing by leaps and bounds, and so uh, that's something we keep thinking about. And so the, these arguments come that there's a new era. In the 1920s, it was all the discoveries that were coming out: the automobile, the telephone, wireless, um, radio. Today is China, India. They're growing. There's no question about it. We have a big business in India, um, but it's all in the market. And if uh, if there's any hiccup. Like the Indian stock market, we've been in the market with uh, 3,000. Our children has made us a lot of money on it. This, uh, four, four years ago, it was 3,000. Today, it's 14,000 in the index. So a lot of what you say is discounted. The Chinese market, the Shanghai Stock Exchange, is like a rocket. And we have learned over time that uh, nothing grows to the sky. And uh, you have these unexpected uh, uh, air bubbles that come in. At pockets, so we have to be careful. But uh, but you know, having said that, that's what, this, it might last for a long time. And so uh, we recognize these things, we protect ourselves. But if we see opportunity, we take advantage of it. But first of all, we're looking at you know, that age-old rule: don't don't lose capital. Make sure you don't lose money. And so uh, our focus is very much on that. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, just a question to clarify for me, Chef. When, when did Ben Graham exit Geico, or did he see this disaster coming? You know, I don't, I, I, a very good question. It's a fascinating. Ben Graham was on the board of directors with his partner, Newman. This is, I just read all of this. And uh, in 1965, he retires. In 1971, Newman retires. And they say we should put Warren Buffett on the board, 1971-72. Buffett owns insurance companies. The SEC says, no, he owns insurance companies. He can't uh, uh, be on the on the board. Makes enough of a noise that they don't put him on the board. And um, I think I think Ben might have. Ben wasn't too keen on. You know, Ben was an intellectual, a widely read guy. He wasn't really interested in making a lot of money. His funds 
even in 1956, it was only 12 million bucks. And he paid off uh, any gains, interest, dividend, capital, he paid it all off. So the funds never grew uh, huge. And so uh, uh, I think a lot of it he, uh, he wrote down, I think. Um, he didn't really uh, think about it uh, um, in any significant way. And I think at the end of the day, the state, this is Janet Lowe. She's got a very nice history of Ben Graham. Worth reading, by the way. He's, he's a state with about three million bucks. But he lived simply and he was a happy guy. And, uh, and a lot of us, me included, have benefited from uh, you know, his teachings. But it was interesting to see that Geico, 25% of his funds in one stock, a controlling position, 50%. And what happened was very interesting. When he got that position, they didn't want to buy it because it wasn't their book value. And so they said, you know, it was our book value by 50,000 bucks. And he said, I almost never, now looking back in 72, we almost never bought, bought it because it was our book value by 50,000. It was worth eventually a billion dollars in 1972. And um, so you go, so, I mean, uh, you know, just in terms of I'm a big believer and, you know, recognize and be grateful for all the good things that have come your way. Because look at this, what happens. He buys it, then the SEC says, you cannot buy more than 10%. The rule, uh, uh, Paul Rivet will remember, in 1940 they came up with a rule that you can't own more than 10% of an insurance company. And so these guys have 50%. So they have to do something. So they uh, uh, call their partners in the fund, and they distribute. They take 10 percent, and they distribute the shares. And they tell them, hey, by the way, the shares will trade on the OTC over the fund. And that's how it went public. Geico went public, and when they got on the board, a few other guys got on the board. Very strong board, smart board. The rest is history. Geico took off. But he retired in 65, and they continued to expand into different areas. There a guy goes out of the village, so they went into different areas and um, then hit the fan. And then um, uh, Warren came in and he bought stock at about three and a half dollars in 1976. Next five years he bought stock. He got a third of the company, his average cost. Tough to think. It was a dollar and a half. And uh, and then he uh, and then Geico just did uh, very, very well. They continued to buy back the stock, its interest went to 50%, and ultimately, uh, I think, uh, way over 10, 15 years later, he bought the remaining 50%. But, um, but it is, business is like that, you know, you have the ups and downs, you can't see what will happen here. I've given you all of these things. If you asked me three years ago, I'd have said the same thing. So you can't, uh, you can't forecast. But your, Ben Graham's big principle was margin of safety. If you're a growth investor, and I know you were talking about growth, you got to be sure that you understand the earnings. Because people who bought the A bonds and the Eastman Kodaks and all of that in 1972 lost 90% of their money in 74. 90%. The guys who bought GE and McDonald's, the real growth, I was looking at McDonald's. McDonald's from 72, from 72, for the next 10 years, grew their earnings per share, grew about six or seven times. Stock was still down. Because it went from 90 times earnings to about 12. And so, um, so you have to be really, really careful, even in a good growth stock, what you pay. But most importantly, you have to be careful that the growth actually takes place. And if you have the ability, as he says, to recognize that growth opportunity, uh, then you can make. Um, and Geico, they said they made more than 200 times their money. On cost, on what they pay. So, um, but Ben, uh, ben was a tremendous uh, uh, teacher, and, uh, and you know the number of people in our own company, you know Burgundy. All uh, you look at value-oriented uh, uh, investors all over Canada, the United States, and in the rest of the world. I've been fortunate to bump into many of them. Long track record of success, um, but all focused on a margin of safety. And um, and today particularly, that's why I thought. I talked about Ben Graham and Bob's because he went through the biggest bubble, and as my good friend Richard was saying, he survived it. He almost didn't survive, but he survived it. He very quickly adjusted to it, cut his borrowing very quickly, and then managed to survive 1931-32, which was really, really tough. That was very, very tough. Yes, sir. Um, 
kind of value investment uh, focus a lot on P-E ratios. I know it kind of sounds a whole story, but it's, uh, it's part of the signal. Uh, could you comment on the P-E ratios as we currently see them in the market? Because you cited the can, they were like really crazy, and you cited the Zotcom, they were crazy. But you could argue that today's ratios are not that crazy unless you're expecting a meltdown in earnings. And your point is really well taken. In the 20s, the PE wasn't that crazy. But what happened was the economy collapsed. <coughs> Today, we all know, profit margins are at record highs, right? They've never been higher. Now, if you think that uh, profit margins are not going to regress to the mean, are coming down to what they've been normally, because of China and India, then you're exactly right. The price earnings ratio of 15, 16, 17, 18 for the S&P is fine. Uh, but that wasn't the case. Uh, we were talking to some uh, one of our uh, bond, really good bond guys, and he, he made the point that 1929 was the only time stock markets usually forecast a recession. They go down before the recession. 1929, the stock market went down first, and the recession took place after. And we might be, we might be in a job. That's what happened then. It might be in a period where the stock market goes down first before the recession takes place. Meaning um, the, you know, in that case, the collapse. But margins can come down significantly. We've gone through a lot of cycles, you know. I've been for 35 years, like you, I can say. Gone through many ups and downs. And, and, um, and uh, at the high, no one sees the downside. The downside is very tough to see. I'm just pointing out some uh, suggestions to you. But you can't see uh, what, what may I said, if you're looking for a catalyst, very tough to, uh, we've always tried to, in this 99, 2000, it was so obvious, but Northern Telecom was buying companies. I guess a smart company that's buying 10, paying $10 billion for a company with no earnings. So you say, maybe, maybe they know something. You know, if I pay 10 billion and they tell you that, uh, you know, there's a lot of efficiencies and they can build a ton of revenues, they need this or they can better do it. They paid 10 billion, 20 billion. Cisco was doing the same thing. And others were doing it. And, uh, and when the music stopped, bang, they all rock. Huge. The music may stop again. So you have to be, uh, you have to be careful. And it, when, when it stops, it stops very quickly. Yes.
uh, you know, it's got the um, uh, Metro Land, it's got community newspapers, it's got Harlequin. Harlequin, this uh, company which I've recommended my books to all of you. Sell <laughs> 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 130 million a year. 130 million books worldwide across the world. And so, uh, and then they've got black, they got lots of other assets. And if you value those assets, we'll use your own judgment. We think it's worth a lot more. And we'd like to have the fellows running it, Rock Richard. I think he's doing a good job in setting it together. Uh, all these people that I would In the case of SFK Pulp, uh, the stock came out of 10, went down at 5. We like the guys and the managing uh, who manage this. And you're buying it at a very uh, low price in relationship to uh, what this company can be worth, particularly if uh, you know the price of that particular specialty pulp that they make, and uh, they get their offside of the Canadian pulp when uh, an entity came out of the yeah. So, to me, it's like you're, we are predicting growth, which is not there yet. So it's, it's not like I, I'm not challenging you. I love it, but, you, but at the same time, we're predicting their special pearl product that they're going to have value in the future. Because all the ways to manage. No, in, uh, if you're in you know, a value investing, what, what happens is suppose the company makes 12% return on equity, right, on average, and at 6%, suppose the return on equity drops to six. Everyone looks at six. Value investors say, hey, it's going back to 12. 15 years, 20 years, it's made 12. For whatever reason, we think it's going back to 12. If, it, if the same 12, it's made 12, and now for one or two years it's making 20, most guys are looking at 20 and extrapolating 20. Value investors will say, hey, it's made only 12. It's coming down, we're going to sell it. And so uh, when you see uh, SFK pulp, it's been the last couple of years is why people are negative on it. The star will be sort of similar. And if you were, uh, you know, we normalize it, we look through the cycle. And, and then there's companies that will make 20 and continue to make 20. Rare companies who do that. That's when you make really good money. If you can find a company that makes 20, 25% and will continue to make it. And you got the right management team, the same guys are doing it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, but, you know, Ben Graham would not want you to go and meet management because his book was written for the average investor. He just wanted anyone who read the book to be a good investor, right? So he didn't want you to have special uh, advantages. But, um, but you know, these days you can meet management in different uh, settings. And uh, we think, like, management, meeting management, getting a sense of management, very, very important. And so, um, um, you know, um, uh, and so for you to make a judgment on whether 20% can continue or whether it's going to come back, those are the things that only uh, hard work, judgment, and a little bit of good fortune will help. I think my time is up. Thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you all. Again.